Hey, what's up everybody? Michael Bodine here with SoulCon, and I am so glad you are here for the March Global Men's Gathering. Hopefully, or you are sitting uh, to your left and right with some brothers, some people from your church, your community, because man, God has really hit me with this message the last few weeks, and I hope that your minds, ears, and hearts are open to what God has to say to each of us today. So. Grab your Bible, spend a couple of minutes in prayer together. I'm gonna to be back in a couple of minutes and we're gonna dive right in. Hey, what's up everybody? Michael Bodine here. And again, I'm so glad you're here, ready to dive in. Hopefully you've got your Bible. Hopefully you've got brothers to your left and right. So we're gonna dive right in. Today, we're gonna be talking about joy and contentment in our lives and what steals that. I love how Craig Rochelle has a really good sermon on how comparison can kill our joy and contentment. We are so focused on everyone else instead of on the cross. But today I wanna to talk about another big joy killer in our lives and that is when we are focused on ourselves. When everything about us is centered on self and what we want, uh, what we need instead of on others and especially not on the cross. The biggest irony in focus on self is that God promised us so many things, abundance, grace, mercy, joy, contentment, but what he did not promise us was our own happiness. And when we are focused on self, that's usually what we're chasing is our own happiness. And that is not something that God promised us. When we are insisting on having our way, it almost always leads to some kind of conflict or destruction in our, our lives. We may not even notice it. It might be small things along the way, but eventually it's probably gonna lead to some pretty big massive destruction in our life that we cannot in any way ignore. I want you to turn with me uh, to James 3, 16, if you've got your Bibles with you. God's word really speaks very clearly so many times throughout scripture about anything that is focused on self or selfishness. Here in James 3, 16, it says, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. This warning in the word rung so true in my life for a long time. If I look back, I found so much disorder and chaos in my life by focusing on myself. I was always seeking that next fix or that next comfort to fix what I thought was wrong with me instead of being completely dependent on the only one that could truly change me. Uh, instead, I was depending on self. And when it suited my needs, I was depending on others. I was hoping sometimes for a breakthrough or a miracle in my life, but I was really unwilling for so long to focus on the one that could bring that miracle about. Selfishness in our lives is this master of disguise. We don't let our true motives really be known to anyone when we are being selfish. Uh, we excel really well at telling a story and justifying things when we are being selfish. Our choices are the most reasonable, right? We even have a way of making them sometimes sound and seem righteous to everyone around us. We become masters of persuasion to our families and friends. Uh, everything on the inside is chaotic and we know that deep down inside but on the outside for all to see we have it all together and our version of what's best is just the way that it needs to be 
my consistent choosing of happiness in my life for so many years, this selfish perspective, it really brought me to ruin over and over again in my past. I would love to say that early on in my life, it led me to a deeper walk with Christ, but it did not bring me to that kind of brokenness that leads to full obedience and contentment in a life following him for a long time. My stubbornness, my selfishness needed the better part of three, almost four decades to finally grasp the destruction that I was causing, not only in my life, but to some of those around me. You see, I, I had these legit things in my life, or so I thought, that I could justify, uh, use to justify my selfish gains the way that I wanted it. So it was okay. I, I had sexual abuse in my past. Uh, I had parents, they were so loving, but you know, my father especially at times was so distant because he was working so much. I really had no one to help me process all the things that I had been through and that had happened to me. And so I was left to deal with it on my own. And so focusing on self was okay. It was warranted. I had justified it over and over again. And I decided that it was just the way that things were going to be. I spent so much of my early adulthood living a double life. Everyone knew this public version of Michael on my own, I was hiding these secrets of how I was dealing with my past, and I was justifying it. When I got married in 2003, I thought it was going to be the fix of so many things, but really getting married only compounded a lot of those problems. I wanted to be this amazing husband, but I was also unwilling to focus on the things and the problems to make things better. And it was just a recipe for disaster. Double life continued, justification continued. It became this wash, rinse, uh, repeat kind of cycle. Uh, and, and again, in my mind and heart, I kept coming up with the reasons why it was okay. But you see, every bit of reasoning that we can come up with, every justification that we tell ourselves it's no match for a God who is willing to continually chase after our hearts. And praise God, he continued to chase after me. Our circumstances, all of the junk that has happened to us or that we put ourselves through, through our choices, it doesn't matter when we put our focus on him. It doesn't matter when we get out of the way and we allow him to do his work in our lives. And so... About six years ago, God chose to recalibrate my perspective, to recalibrate my mind, will, and emotions, and man, the brokenness that was finally brought about in my life. And I'd like to say it, it was awesome because it is, but man, at first it was so painful. I had so long held this version of the truth, also known as a lie, uh, I had justified for so long being a lousy husband and my awesome, beautiful, grace-filled wife was going to look the other way and continue to be this beautiful woman, this faithful woman, and I was being anything but. And all of this was just my false reality. All of this had become this comfort that I had grown accustomed to and God saw fit to have this house built of sand just come crumbling down all around me. And it was painful. Man, you ever had a big old Band-Aid on a hairy part like on your arm? When that Band-Aid got ripped off and all of the nasty stink of that, all of my choices that came spilling out, um, it was horrible. It was tough. And God had my attention. The recalibration of my mind, body, and spirit had begun, and there was no turning back for me. My lifelong love affair with myself and my comforts, they were coming to a painful but very purposeful end. And today, man, I get to say praise God for that. Uh, I want you to turn with me in Philippians 2. Uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, Is there any encouragement from belonging, belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love? any fellowship together in the spirit are your hearts tender and compassionate then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose don't be selfish 
Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Love, and let's get real, the ultimate expression of love is only through Christ. Love does not insist on its own way. If we are to be like him, and that is our calling, then pride, ego, our comforts, our hang-ups, our vices, everything has got to go to the wayside. It cannot be at the forefront of who we are. God is more interested in freeing us of ourselves and changing us than changing our circumstances. I want you to remember that Paul sat in a horrible prison. He was in bondage. He was in pain, and he was in the greatest of uncertainty. But he knew who he was in Christ. He had his mind, body, will, and emotions completely recalibrated through the blood of Christ. You see, I had to stop resenting my past. I had to forgive a lot of people, even though it wasn't their fault anyway. I had blamed them for so long. I had to start putting my trust in a father who always only wanted me to be free, to obey, to love others, and to lead those around me. I had to start seeking real freedom, the freedom that comes from obedience in Christ. Like Paul, he was in prison, and he was more free than anyone around him. Wow. And how did that come about? Because of his focus, not on himself or his, or his circumstances, but on God, on what God had done and what God was doing in his life, sitting right there in that prison. God showed me over time, the last five to six years, how selfish I'd been uh, and began to turn my focus ultimately to, or to others and ultimately to him. Uh, the last part of that scripture I read earlier, in lowliness of mind, this is verses 3 and 4 of Philippians 2. Lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. When I finally stopped being that guy, it all became pretty simple. Jesus tells us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are to love others as much as we naturally love ourselves. Instead of always anxiously seeking help from others or expecting everyone around me to bend to what I wanted, never finding true rest, always thirsting for more, always looking for that fix, never being filled, I could, I can, we can be those men who consistently look and seek to serve those around us. The enemy fights really hard to take our focus off of this and to change our minds to get in the way of God's recalibration. I'm still sometimes tempted to be that guy, to be absorbed in my thoughts, tempted to be engrossed only in self uh, and what I want, my problems, but I, we have to continue to look to the ultimate example of what a real man looks like, and that is Jesus who served selflessly. The result when we allow him to recalibrate our thinking is eternal contentment, not momentary pleasure. We can be assured that operating in this way, we can overcome every trial and every sin. We can have faith that no matter what comes in front of us or gets in the way, we can overcome it through the blood of Christ. So much like for years I sat in church and I heard sermons like this and I thought, wow, how? Some of you are probably sitting there today going, how do, do I do that? I think sometimes we have to pray pr uh, some prayers that we're not used to praying. Uh, Craig Rochelle calls them dangerous prayers. Pray, we have to pray the, the, these prayers and asking God to search us, to reveal things in us, to convict us. And that's hard, but we need to ask those uh, questions of God sometimes. God will show us where our focus needs adjusting. God wants to transform us into his image. He wants to recalibrate who we are. We have to wake up every day, no matter how we feel, how much sleep we got, what's going on around us, and we have to dig into the disciplines that we know we're supposed to be doing. We have to be on our knees and praying. We have to dig in the Word, and not only reading the Word, but asking God to reveal Himself even more clearly while we're there. 
It's why what we do in SoulCon is so important. Not so that we can check the boxes of discipline and say that we did this or that, but so that our mind, will, and emotions is prepared for anything that the enemy is going to throw at us. The disciplines are so important because nothing changes if nothing changes. And that's so important. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season... We shall reap if we do not lose heart. So today, this morning, what are you feeding? Because that is what is winning in your life right now. If you are placing your value and your focus is in Christ, then that is what kind of warrior you are going to be. We use here in SOCON Proverbs 27, 17 a lot. Uh, Iron sharpens iron, right? It hopefully motivates us when we hear it, we see it, we read it. It motivates us to be better. But let's talk about this for a minute. We need each other. God has designed us to do life together, to push each other closer to him as we get this unique glimpse through this ministry into each other's lives daily in this awesome ministry environment. Iron sharpens iron only works if the iron spiritual strength that you bring to me and that I bring to you is hitting, pushing, scraping, serving alongside the same and maybe even stronger iron. Aluminum is not going to sharpen iron, and a piece of iron cannot sharpen itself. It has to meet that other powerful surface to smooth out all the chips and cracks to make it sharp again. We've had probably all of you experiences with brothers who push us to be better than we are and unfortunately some experiences where we're pushed the other way but a godly christian brother can sharpen you in areas where maybe you lack and they are strong for example a wise friend can make you wiser a loving friend by setting an example for you can expand your capacity to love others and a friend with more biblical knowledge can enhance your understanding of scripture, can encourage you to dig in, deep dive in, maybe more intimately in the word than you ever have before. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. I believe in the community this ministry brings so much. I've said it so many times, and I'm going to say it again here this morning. I am without a doubt a better man, a better husband, a better father, because within the context of, do, context of doing community the way we get to do it, I get to see, hear, and even experience face-to-face seeing how each of you gets to navigate these roles in your lives. So in that importance that I hope we can all agree on, on this version of community, We need to fully realize the challenge that is before us. We are not as useful in sharpening each other if we continue to confess sexual sin, if we can continue to view pornography, uh, and and we're not putting up any any blockers on our devices. We're not putting up any defense. We're not using the accountability around us. We are not as useful in sharpening others if in public we're husband and father of the year. But man, at home, our families really have a tough time dealing with us. We are not as useful in sharpening others. If at work, our coworkers really don't know much about our relationship with Christ, but they can count on us for a raunchy joke in the break room. We are not as useful in sharpening others if we operate in a double life mentality, deciding that Man, we got this spiritual life thing kind of figured out, and outside of of that, we can really operate however we want, and that's just not reality within how God wants us and calls us to be. I want you to consider this example from Scripture, and this is a story that we're all so familiar with. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, their focus had been completely on themselves and also what the enemy wanted them to do. But suddenly, within a few words, God recalibrated their minds and hearts. He called out to Adam and Eve, where are you? He knew where they were. They appeared from their hiding. They were wearing fig leaves and personally ashamed. And the first thing that God asks, who told you 
that you were naked. I bet most of you, you read this story and you gloss over that uh, like it's not a big deal, but I want to stop there for a minute and think about this. Their nakedness was not an issue until they had sinned, and the truth of their focus on self had been revealed. Their very identity was suddenly a question as they were hiding and covering themselves. Who told you that your value is no longer found in me, but instead in your selfish wants and needs? Who has deceived you? And the same answer was true for them as it is today for us. I see this as this big spiritual metaphor for how our sin, our focus on self, which is sin, it's often this catalyst for us. Uh, it takes us away from the truth of who we are in Christ. Uh, it brings about this shame, this doubt, this feeling of we are no longer qualified to serve others, to teach others, to reach others. And it's a justification Man, it was in my life for so long for everything that is wrong, everything that separates us from God. The bottom line is this, and I want you to look left and right. I want you to see who you are in the room with. I want you to think about your families. There are people in your life who need you, and they need you at your best in Christ. You have been placed where you are with a purpose. You have been through what you've been through with a purpose, no matter how it feels right now. I want to ask you a question. What have you been trying to win by keeping your perspective focused on you? How has managing this sin of self and selfishness worked out for you? Are you tired of putting up a front of covering tracks? <laughs> I was, man. <clears throat> you will never find maturity in Christ, never find maturity in Christ by going down the pathways of impurity or disobedience. It doesn't work that way. We have to turn to him. God can and will make a man who is completely absorbed with his past and with his self and living a lie daily. God can and will take that man and transform him. I'm going to close shortly, and when I do, I want you to get into your small groups. I want you to open the app. I want you to go through the debrief, debrief questions together. If you don't have anyone with you, I want you to get on, those, get on the app, pull up the questions, and use our SoulCon pages uh, to go through that accountability with our digital uh, community there. Uh, but before I close, I, I know you've probably already noticed the shirt that I have on. Awesome new shirt that's going to be in the shop. So hopefully after everything's over today, you'll go check that out. Uh, let me close today. Uh, brothers, if there's anything in your life that has allowed you uh, to, to be in the way of his work, uh, to hinder you from loving others ultimately as Christ has called you to, if your love of yourself, your focus on self has stood in the way of contentment in Christ, the magnificent truth that I want us to all grasp is that we've never needed to be focused on self because the one who deserves all of our attention, the one who deserves all of our focus, is completely and totally focused on us and our heart and everything about us. It's awesome when we accept that truth. A perspective built on self says, I can't, I will never, I could never, but I want to. That always happens to me. That never happens to me. That's not possible. But when we have allowed the Holy Spirit to infiltrate our hearts and minds and lives and to do his work, when our perspective is fully rooted in the blood of Christ, our perspective says, I can do all things through Christ. I am more than a conqueror. With God, nothing is impossible. Man, amen, praise God. I'm so thankful for you guys being here today. A couple of things. If you are a man watching this, I challenge you today, do not wait. I want you to go online or send us an email. Get on uh, Facebook. March 30th, we've got both uh, Warrior Elite 9 and SoulCon Challenge Victor launching. And you need to be there. If you're a man watching this, you need to be there. Get on there, sign up. And on April 11th will be our next Global Men's Gathering. And don't miss out. So glad you guys were here today. 